So after declaring the work of God's grace for us in chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul, the Apostle Paul, has been describing God's work of grace through us in chapters 4, 5, and 6. He's been describing in the second part of his letter, chapters 4, 5, and 6, he's been describing what grace and practice looks like. So I've said for the last few weeks that in chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul declares vertical grace, God's work of grace for us. And then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he's describing horizontal grace or God's work of grace through us. And in the verses that we looked at last week where we looked at husband and wife and children and parents and employers and employees and those sorts of things, in the verses we looked at last week, he describes the way God's grace affects our relationships to one another. The whole purpose of that section that we looked at last week was how does this amazing grace of God begin to affect our relational contexts, the relationships that we have? Um, And he makes in those verses one primary point that I just want to reiterate for just a second this morning. He makes one primary point in the verses we looked at last week, and the point is this, that the difference between a relationship that works and a relationship that doesn't work is grace. It's that simple. The primary difference between a relationship that works, a relationship that is thriving, a healthy relationship, and a relationship that doesn't work or a relationship that is falling apart is grace. Grace is what distinguishes a warm relationship from a cold relationship. Grace is the secret sauce that helps relationships breathe and thrive and and grow. Relationships characterized by ungrace tend to bite the dust. And we've all probably experienced that to one degree or another. But relationships where grace is central always thrive, always. Where grace is present, and this is Not only true for relationships, but in all of life. Where grace is present, there is life. There's lightness. There's life. But where grace is absent, there is only death. There's bitterness and tension and resentment and sadness and frustration and and despair and anger and those sorts of things. And so what Paul does in the verses we looked at last week was identify the secret sauce of grace that alone can provide us with healthy relationships that breathe and that are life-giving rather than life-taking. Now, what Paul does in these verses that I just read is to show that living a life of grace in a world of ungrace is war. It's war. I mean, all of the language that he uses here is the language of battle. It's wartime language. He talks about who our enemies are and the kind of things they do to trip us up. And he talks about external enemies and internal enemies, enemies on the ground and enemies in the air. He talks about all of the ways in which we are distracted and and the things that we need to do in order to be prepared for battle. And so he wants us to know in these verses that everything he's described up until this point, chapter 4, 5, and the first part of chapter 6, this life of grace, grace and practice, what what makes a free life on the ground, uh, everything he's talked about. Now he's nearing the end of his letter and he wants to say, now listen, there is going to be opposition to this. You're going to face opposition to this. Uh, It's not like okay, I am now committing to live my life gracefully, and then life all of a sudden gets easy. No, actually, it oftentimes gets much more difficult because, as he makes clear here, living a life of grace in a world of ungrace is is war. The struggle is real. It's all around us. It's above us. It's beside us. It's inside us, and it's not going away. Verse 10, where Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Uh, The word finally there is better translated from this point forward, okay? So rather than it read finally, you could almost replace the word finally with from this point forward. And the reason that's important to note is because Paul is not simply saying, hey, I'm nearing the end of my letter. Here are my final thoughts. That's not what he's saying. 
What he's saying is that life in this world will be characterized by conflict. So any thought that, you know, having a relationship with God or being connected to to God is going to make life easier, Paul wants to clarify for us. He wants to dispel us of that notion because he wants us to know that life with God even though God stabilizes us and gives us the peace that we need, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, even though all of that is true, life with God is war. And life lived in the light of his grace is war. Um, And so he's saying that life in this world is going to be characterized by conflict, and our only hope for survival is to put on the armor of God. Okay, that's what's going on here. Um, now, I want to I look at what all these pieces of armor represent, uh, but let me first point something out in the expression, the whole armor of God, okay, which he says here twice in these verses. The emphasis of that phrase, the whole armor of God, is the two words, of God, okay? Now, that's important. It's important because, well, it's important for a bunch of reasons, but it's important because He wants us to know that this is no ordinary armor. It's made by God. It's given to us by God. Any armor that we try to manufacture, any of the ways in which we, in our own power, try to protect ourselves or generate a meaningful life or get ahead or move forward, they'll all fail. Man-made armor doesn't work in this kind of war. And so he wants us to know that this is, this is no ordinary armor. It's made by God, and it's given to us by God. And it's important in light of that to know this, that every day, whether you realize it or not, every day we put on armor to help us through life. Every day. You may have never thought about it in those terms. But every day, every single one of us is, is putting on armor to help us through life. We rely on our goodness our perceived goodness, our, our willpower, our money, our skills, our, our status, our family, our looks, our resourcefulness and ingenuity, our, our smarts. We rely on all of these things to help us move forward. All of us, in other words, depend on something or someone to help us make it through the day, to save us. So in this sense... All of us put armor on. So it's not whether you're putting on armor, we are, but whether the armor you're putting on can save you. That's that's the real question. We're all doing it. And so part of this exercise here this morning is to help us become a little bit more self-aware regarding the armor that we perhaps unconsciously put on on a daily basis and why the armor we put on on a daily basis may be a contributing factor to why life feels the way that it does. Paul says that since we are not at war against stuff we can see, but against powers in places that we can't see, no armor but God's armor is strong enough to save you. Okay, he makes that clear. I've always loved these verses uh, for a couple of reasons, but one of the primary reasons I love these verses is because... Uh, Paul tells us that our primary enemy is not the person sitting next to you or some circumstance in this world. It's not your boss. It's not your spouse. It's not your child. It's not your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It's not your husband. Um, it's It's not the other person. He says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our primary enemy is not one another. Okay, It's not the other guy. It's not them. If God would just get rid of them, I would be happier and this world would be a better place. Okay, that's not the primary enemy. He identifies the primary enemy as not being flesh and blood, but um, principalities and powers in unseen places, things that are at work that we can't see, forces that are at work that we, that we can't see, that we, we can't identify with our senses necessarily. Um, now, I... I used to think that um, these six pieces of armor that Paul lists are all separate. You know, like, on this day, I was pretty good about putting on my helmet of salvation, but unfortunately, I left my breastplate of righteousness at home. So tomorrow, I've got to remember my breastplate of righteousness, and in remembering my breastplate of righteousness, I forgot my, what? What's another one? Belt of truth, okay? 
Um, I used to think that, you know, these were, these were all uh, separate pieces. And while they are distinct, obviously, um, they are all gifts of God's grace to help us through the ups and downs and twists and turns of life. In other words, all six pieces are different parts of the one gift of God's grace. And they all point, every single one of these Every single one of these pieces of armor point to an ache in the human soul. Let me explain what I mean by that in a second. Th these are all things we long for and things that we need that only God can supply. For example, the belt of truth, the first piece. The belt of truth speaks to our deep longing for certainty. We all long for certainty. We all want to know who we are and where we stand, what's true and what's not. We long to be tethered to something we can bank on, something dependable. None of us want our lives to feel unsteady. We don't want to feel like we're being tossed to and fro. We really feel, we want to be anchored. We, we need to know who we are so that we're anchored, so that we're not tossed around so that we're tethered to something dependable, something transcendent, something that will ground us. Well, the truth about us is that we are not defined by what we do or what we fail to do, thank God. We're not defined by our worst moments or our greatest accomplishments. We're not defined by our struggles. We're not defined by our successes. We're not defined by our strengths. We're not defined by our weaknesses. We are, the truth about us is that we are defined by the God who loves us forever and ever. Amen. That's the truth about us. So the belt of truth that's described here, the thing that can sort of fend off all of the various attacks that we will face that will tempt us to identify ourselves by what we do or to think of ourselves primarily in terms of what we have failed to do. That leaves us weak and defeated on the field of battle. But when we understand that to live is Christ, to die is gain, and because of what God has done for us, we are firmly footed, placed. We are in with God forever. And because of that, our ultimate identity, who, what defines us is who God is and God's love for us. So the belt of truth speaks to our deep longing for certainty, and it tells us that the truth about us is that who we ultimately are is not based on our work, but Jesus' work for us. Not our performance, but Jesus' performance for us. Not our devotion and our love and our goodness, but Jesus' devotion and Jesus' love and Jesus' goodness for us. The breastplate of righteousness, the second piece, speaks to our deep longing for approval. To be righteous means that God has made things right between us and him. That's what it means, very simply. To be righteous means that God has done everything necessary to make things right between us and him. And what that means is that we have been fully and finally approved by God. Not because of what we have done or because we deserve it. We have been fully and finally approved of God because of what Jesus has done for us, his work for us. Now, the reason that's important and very true is because every day we're looking for approval. Some of you realize that and some of you don't realize that. But every day in ways that are conscious and in ways that are unconscious, we're, we're looking for approval. If we can outrun, outthink, outperform, outread, outsell, outbuy, outlook the next person, then we'll be approved. Then we'll be somebody. If we can get the right people to like us, and if we can sort of make our way to the front of the line and work hard and get to the front, then maybe, maybe we'll get the approval that we're searching for. Maybe we'll get our father's approval, our mother's approval, our husband's approval, our, our wife's approval, our children's approval, whatever the case may be. We'll get the approval of the people that we respect the most, that we feel we need their approval in order to survive. Um, but God has given us his approval, that's what the breastplate of righteousness speaks to, that God has given us his approval. So we don't need to pine for the approval of everybody else. Because we're in with God, 
We don't need to be in with everybody else for our lives to have meaning and purpose. Now, you take that truth into the field of battle, that also gives you some firm footing to understand that I don't need, and I've said this before, um, but because it is finished, I don't have to fight for everybody's approval. The only person's approval that I ultimately need is God's, and I already have it. Well, that's huge. Now I can live my life, and while I may enjoy the fact that you may like me and you may approve of me, I don't need you to like me. I don't need you to approve of me because God approves of me, and that's the approval that I need in the deepest places. Um, the next piece are the, the shoes of the gospel, or in some translations, the, the boots of the gospel, and that really does speak to our longing for direction. We all want to know which way to go. We all want to know how to navigate our lives. We're looking for peace regarding what we do, the decisions we make. I've heard over the years, oftentimes people say, I just want to have peace about this. I've got this decision that I need to make, or I'm, I'm contemplating this direction that I want to go, but I really, I really want to have peace, or I don't have peace about it, or, or I'm beginning to have peace about it. We all long for this. We all... We all want uh, to know how to navigate our lives. We're, we're looking for peace regarding where to go and what to do and all of those things. We read self-help books and listen to podcast after podcast after po podcast to the experts on everything from how to parent to how to land the best job. I mean, we are all looking for the way, all of us. It's, it's so blatant and it's so explicit that it's impossible to miss. I mean, we're, we, we are a, the world is filled with people who are trying to figure out the way. Where do we go? What direction do we go? And everything from big stuff to little stuff. Well, the gospel presents Jesus as the way. And what this means is that when we come to him, the search is over. He doesn't say, come to me and I'll show you the way. He says, I am the way. I am your home. I am your sanctuary. I am where you need to be. You don't need to worry about this, that, and the other. When you come to me, I, I give you everything you need. Everything you need. So the shoes of the gospel speak to our longing for direction. And the gospel presents Jesus as the way the one who gives us everything we need. The search is over when Jesus finds us. Well, the next piece is the shield of faith, and that really does speak to our longing for protection. Okay, now you have to be dead or dumb to not realize that we are all looking for protection in one way, shape, or form. Primarily, we're looking for protection against those things that we fear the most. So, for example, if your greatest fear is rejection, you will depend on getting acceptance to save you. And you will do whatever it takes to get acceptance. If your greatest fear is losing, then you'll depend on winning all the time to save you. If when you lose, it could be losing an argument, losing an opportunity, missing out on something. If when you lose, you feel paralyzed... What that tells you is that you, you depend on your ability to win to save you, to establish you. If your greatest fear is uncertainty, which I know a lot of people's fear is uncertainty, if your greatest fear is uncertainty, you'll depend on being in control to save you. You'll need to be in control. You'll be a control freak. You'll try to control circumstances and control people. You'll always be trying to control. Well, your control freakness, okay, is an indication that your greatest fear is uncertainty. If your greatest fear is loneliness, you will depend on relationships to save you. So if you... If you are, um, you know, if, if, if this relationship isn't working or that relationship is not working, you'll, you'll want to die. It'll paralyze you. If, you. if your greatest fear is relationships, if, I mean, your greatest fear is loneliness, you will depend on the relationships around you to save your life. And that dependence puts pressure on those relationships that 
in most cases, ends those relationships. Um, if, you, uh, if your greatest fear is failure, then you'll depend on accomplishments to save you. You'll, you'll feel this internal pressure to always be accomplishing something, always be achieving something, always doing something and, and being good at something. If, if your greatest fear is failure, you'll depend on accomplishments to save you. Faith, okay, and this is the shield of faith. Faith is believing that everything you need and long for are already yours because of what Jesus has done for you and given to you. And this faith alone, believing that, Okay, this faith alone has the power to protect you from depending on lesser things to give you what only God can give you. Failure to believe that God already loves and accepts you because of who Jesus is will cause you to try and get love and acceptance through something you do or by something you become. And so faith protects us from from trusting in things smaller than God to be for us what only God has promised to be. Um, the helmet of salvation, which is the, the next piece, speaks to our deep longing to be rescued. All of us long to be rescued in one way, shape, or form. We long to be rescued. We want to be rescued from meaninglessness and hopelessness, from the fear of missing out or not measuring up. We, we want to be rescued from our insecurities, from our guilt, from our shame, from our regret. And we depend on so many things to rescue us. Well, the helmet of salvation is that piece of God's gift of grace where he says, listen, you're, you're mine now. I've got you. I've done it all for you. I've saved you. I've rescued you. You're safe with me. I am the friend who will never leave you. I am the light behind whatever darkness you face. I am the shining that your shame cannot extinguish. I am what comes after deserving. Your guilt died with me. I am guilt without cost. I am. I am. Before the foundation of the world, I am for you. Jesus didn't say, come to me and I'll show you how to rescue yourself. Come to me and I'll give you a to-do list so that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's not what he said. He said, come to me if you're tired of hiding. Come to me if you're tired of trying to make it on your own. Come to me if you're tired of being afraid that people won't love you if they see the real you. Come to me if you're tired of keeping up with appearances. And I will give you rest. In other words, I've come to rescue you. Don't bank on anything smaller than God to rescue you in those places where you long to be rescued in the deepest ways. And then finally, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, Paul tells us, is, is God's word. It's God's word to us. It's God's word to us that we are all much worse and more desperate than we think we are, okay, which is the bad news. But it's also God's word to us that his grace is infinitely bigger and brighter than anything we could ever possibly imagine. In other words, God speaks two words to us. He speaks a word of law and he speaks a word of gospel. The law exposes us. It's be perfect as God in heaven is perfect. That's all you have to do. You just have to be perfect. Well, Jesus stating that we must be perfect should obviously expose to us all of the ways in which we are imperfect. In other words, the law is God's word to us that is intended to flatten us. It's a wall that we crash into so that we come face to face with our own powerlessness, our own weakness, because it's only when we are lying flat on our back that we begin to realize how much we need God's grace, how desperate we are for what God has given to us and what God has done for us. And so God speaks a word of law, be perfect. But then he also speaks a word of gospel, his second word, when he says essentially, so are you now clear on the fact that you're imperfect? And with head hung low, in a sense of shame, we go, yes, we know we're imperfect. And God says, I've got good news for you. Jesus was perfect for you. Game over. End of story. 
You are in with God forever because of what someone else has done for you. So that this isn't about earning and achieving and being good enough and and dotting your I's and crossing your T's. That's not what this is about because in order to be good with me, perfection is required. And you can't do it. You didn't do it. You haven't done it. You won't do it. So Jesus did it for you. Well, that's God's word to us. The sword of the spirit is is God's word coming to us in two words, a word of diagnosis and a word of deliverance, a word of exposing and a word of exoneration. That's the sword of the spirit. Well, that's incredibly helpful and powerful when we are on the field of battle. It it generates a deep and profound sense of self-awareness. If you go into battle thinking, I'm a good person, I'm strong, I'm moral, I can do this. I mean, Isaiah tells us, beware when you think you're standing firm. I mean, I can tell you right now, and I, um, I was so convinced, okay? I mean, I had great models all around me my entire life. And I've said this before, but uh, on numerous occasions, and you've probably heard me talk about it on numerous occasions in different ways, but I mean, I, my life came crashing down in 2015 in part because I cheated on my first wife and ended in divorce. And because I was a public person, it was very public and it was embarrassing and, and I lost everything overnight, understandably so. And what's so interesting about that is that is the one thing I was convinced would never happen to me. I had put safeguards in place and I had built, I had put boundaries in place. I mean, I was meticulous about that stuff, very meticulous. And I took a page out of my granddad's book, which basically said, I will never be alone with a woman anywhere ever unless it's my wife, ever. And I was like, man, I'm going to, that is great wisdom. I mean, in my early 20s, I adopted that and I imposed that on all of the staff members that worked for me. I mean, it was, you know, just to be, be on guard, to be safe. And if that is the one area that I was like, I'm strong, I'm firm. Well, when you walk out onto the field of battle thinking, I may trip up over here, but I'll never trip up over there, ever. You have to be, you have to be careful. That's one of the blessings of God's law is it tells you you're weaker than you think you are. That is so helpful when you're fighting a war. I mean, the the proud, the person who thinks they're strong, the person who thinks they can do it, the person who thinks that they're mighty, that they're warriors, those are the ones that go down. Arrogance, pride, uh, an inflated view of the self hurts us in war. It hurts us in life. It doesn't help us. But an honest assessment of who we are in light of God's call on our lives to be perfect and realizing we're weak. We are, in the old theological words, totally depraved. Now, there's a difference between total depravity and utter depravity, okay? Utter depravity is the idea that all of us are as bad as we could possibly be. Well, thankfully, God's restraining grace keeps even the worst of us from becoming as bad as we could possibly be. Things could be a lot worse, in other words. Total depravity, on the other hand, speaks to the fact that Sin has affected us in the totality of our being so that there's no part of us, our thinking, our feeling, our doing, the, our, bod, the, our bodies, our souls, there's no part of us that is sin-free. We are all broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. And taking that um, assessment, that honest assessment into battle is incredibly helpful. And then being able to walk onto the battlefield going, regardless of what happens here, I, I'm, I'm, the victory that I need most has already been won. So that's why Paul was able to say, to live as Christ and to die as gain, when his, when his life was being threatened, he was like, what do you think you can take from me? I mean, if you let me live, I'm going to keep preaching. And if people stop showing up, I'll preach to the trees. You can't shut me up. And if you decide to put me to death because I won't shut up, well, then I'm with Jesus. So you lose either way, and I win either way. Well, that's God's word of gospel. That's his word of exoneration. 
that yes, you are weak and yes, you are frail and yes, you were ultimately dependent on me. You're not as strong as you think you are, but there was one who was strong for you. There was one who has pioneered, Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, has gone before us and he's bushwhacked a trail and we're with him and he's with us. So the, the sword of the spirit is, is the incisive surgical word from God that declares, I don't need to save myself. I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to prove myself. It sets me free from the pressure to search high and low for happiness or to think that um, me thinking that I'm a strong, good person is good for me. The sword of the Spirit is God's word from above that I no longer need to live for the love of others because I live from the love of God. So I'm unhindered and free. Um, so when it's all said and done, the full armor of God is Jesus. <laughs> I mean, it's Jesus and his work for us. It's just, it's looking at the same it's looking at the same diamond from a different angle. Rather than six different diamonds, it's looking at the same one just from a, just from a different angle and getting a, getting a different perspective on the one gift of God's grace that comes to us supremely and perfectly in the person of Jesus. That everything Jesus is and everything Jesus accomplished for us is represented in all of these pieces. And so at the end of the day, the call that Paul is saying here for us in order to survive is live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished. And that won't make life easy. <laughs> life is war. Conflict is all over the place, inside of you, outside of you. But the one who has done for you what you could never do for yourself has promised to be with you in the valley of the shadow of death. He's promised to walk with you.